First off, as you probably all know, the term fundamentalism is a coined word emerging in the beginning of the 20th century within the Protestant community. Toward the beginning of the 20th century, Protestants in America thought of themselves as beset by the tendencies of modernity, of the complexities and the perceived relativism emerging from the secular world and from the Enlightenment. And there was a strong impulse to return to what was labeled the fundamentals. This meant a reading of the biblical text in a way which gave certainty, clarity, and definition to the group. But the term fundamentalism in the manifestation you may be familiar with in the Jerry Falwells or the Pat Robinsons of this world is a much broader category from the point of view of scholars of religion. Indeed, since the University of Chicago has published in 1990 to 1995 a five-volume study on the dynamics of fundamentalism, which is edited by uh, Appleby and Marty, this term fundamentalism is applicable to a very wide range of expression in, within world religions. So I'm thinking of the ultra-orthodox uh, within Judaism. I'm thinking of the Lefevrite community within conservative or extremely reactionary Catholicism to the dynamics of the Second Vatican Council, the Iranian Revolution under Ayatollah Khomeini, and in its virulent form, the Taliban and Hamas. Now, of course, there's so many differences one could make just in that li laundry list of expressions. But what I'm going to try to do is take a look at what is typical and thus gives these multiple manifestations the expression or the title of fundamentalist. First of all, from a fundamentalist point of view, modernity has really failed. It has promised so much, but yet we live in a world where half of humanity goes to bed hungry, the environment is being destroyed, the Enlightenment and scientific revolution, which was promised to turn humanity and, to, and the human planet into a paradise, has failed that the secular impulse is seen as profoundly dangerous, grounded in a materialism, a sensuality, a relativism, and that the only way to preserve one's identity is to become more and more protected, more and more into an enclave or an enclave where one can define the self as the good Christian versus the lukewarm the good Jew versus those who have accommodated themselves to the modern world and have become assimilated. At Bob Jones University, an expression of Christian fundamentalism, there is surrounding the university a rather high fence, which some scholars have noted has much more than a protective value in terms of keeping thieves and uh, difficulties from entering into that space, that fence sets the boundary. It sets the boundary between we who are the holy, the pure, the good, and they. Now, dualistic thinking, us, them, the purity that comes from self-definition, we're inside the fence, you're outside the fence. We ascribe to the fundamentals of the Bible, you interpret it in accord with whatever human idea you happen to have at any given moment. This enclave mentality is a reaction to a perceived marginalization of religion that when religion used to be 
in that golden past, highly informa informative of the whole of the culture. When in the past, religion had a much greater and more significant role, but not so today within the modern world. Thus, there seems to be within the fundamentalist impulse the necessity to preserve the purity of the in-group. This boundary making is reinforced in a whole host of ways. In the language, which as I've mentioned is very dualistic, good versus evil, truth versus error. In the framing of the conflict, we are the holy war warriors, they are the great Satan. The boundary making is reinforced by the habits of the community in terms of their religious activity and expression. Think of the role hymns have in, the, uh, in Protestant uh, fundamentalism, 19th century Protestant hymns, the significance of them, or 18th or 19th century Hasidic uh, chants within uh, Orthodox Judaism, traditional Muslim folk music, traditional Latin hymns within conservative Catholicism, as opposed to the dominant hedonistic expression of music, boundary making. There are vestment codes, proper dress, hairstyles, proper lengths of beards. The enclave gives to the followers comfort, identity, security, as it is simultaneously confining, rigid. There's a goal, the past is thought of as a moment where things were perfect, the time, say, of the prophet, the time of Jesus, the 13th, the greatest of centuries. There's a foundational myth that gives to the community its identity. I was very impressed when visiting Salt Lake City to see all about Salt Lake, the foundational myth expressed in its art, where pioneer women and men are on every street corner in bronze. The future is looked at as the time when the enemy will be overcome, the Messiah will arrive, the hidden imam will become clear. The past, a glorious moment which gives instruction and identity. The future, that realm when it all will be resolved, but the present is just a mess. Fundamentalism never underestimates how bad things really are and continually points out the decay of modern civilization all about it. This dualistic conceptualization encourages the identification of sacred space versus secular, the pure sphere versus the impure sphere. These kinds of manifestations within world religions tend to be authoritarian, rooted in an authoritative document, that social structures tend to be hierarchical, with one or a few leaders upon, on the top, most often male, who define the identity of the whole community. Democracy is not put forward as the ruling principle, but rather commands, demands, and interpretation from the sacred text that often is perceived as having dropped down from heaven. In general then, the commonest tendencies in those manifestations of religion which we could label fundamentalistic a moral Manichaeism, very, uh, a great selectivity in terms of the texts 
and the interpretation of those texts, a rigid pyramidal hierarchical structure, boundary making is reinforced by behavior, by dress, by rituals, by sacred space. Now, the world's a mess. From a fundamentalist perspective, as I'm trying here to give it some structure, as it cuts across world religions. Thus, we have three possible responses to the mess. One is, create your own community, which is so secure that you try to avoid contamination. It's kind of like a germ theory, that fundamentally, you've got the germs out there and we will do all that we can to not get contaminated. I think of the self-sustaining uh, Amish groups. I think of Orthodox Judaism, which seeks to create an entire dynamic, self-sustaining, its own world, and then there is, on the fringe, all that which is not us. Here, the strong emphasis upon preserving the group and its identity without running the risk of catching the infection of the modern world. That's one response, and it is common if you look at world religions from a broad perspective. A second response. A second response is perhaps, excuse me, the most common response. Not that you form your own Amish group, but that you go and seek to transform the world. So in other words, it's not renouncing the world, it's transforming the world. Here, uh, the power of mass communication. Drive through the South sometime and turn on your radio and there'll be one fundamentalist preacher after another seeking to help you get saved. I think of the power of uh, the, the Catholic uh, news ne uh, television network, EWTN, Eternal Word. It's all about this uh, conversion, transformation, send you the right message. Uh, just the other day I had a marvelous discussion on my doorstep with a Jehovah Witness who is seeking to explain carefully why I should become an Aryan. Now, what you've got here is the, not world renouncing, but world transforming. So from the purity of my space, after I've been reinforced in a life of prayer and sacrifice, I seek to preach the good news, to help others see the truth, and to come on over, and thus find redemption. Now there is a third response, a third response which we have painfully become more and more aware of in our own contemporary situation. I could call it not world renouncing, not world transforming, but rather world conquering. The great Satan is so evil that its very continued existence is a threat to us. And we are, are told by God directly to participate in the cosmic battle against absolute evil. And thus, to remain in accord with God's will some fundamentalist expressions have turned to terrifying violence. Now, within the traditions of religion, there of course are texts where God finally gets so fed up with the rottenness of the situation that God acts to annihilate 
the evildoers. What you're getting in the terrorism that we have become familiar with is a kind of activity that creates in the viewer awe. It's not just violence, it's theatrical, ritualistic, awesome annihilation of the other who is the enemy at the core, the great Satan. So the attack is against the symbols of American power, of American capitalism, the World Trade Center, or the federal government's building in Oklahoma City, or those pleasure palaces in Baha'i, the attack against bars or beaches. What happens here is when you're thinking within the realm of I need to make present the sacred, then the ritualistic intensity of the expression of terror, which is part of a cosmic struggle, which is transformative for the people who participate in it and demonstrates to the enemy that their time is short and they are sure to lose. The violence then is emerging from a view that we alone have the absolute. Of course there are political and economic dynamics and we see this in the Middle East, but think of the suicide bomber who consecrates his activity not only to win political freedom from the people he perceives to be oppressed, but to participate in the absolute will of the divine to express in the most dramatic way possible in the sacrifice of his own life that he is a full and committed soldier in the cosmic drama of good against evil. Thus, terrorism, I would suggest, is often analyzed in terms of certain political and economic motivations, and certainly that, that's there and needs to be considered. But there is about it a, a profound symbolic, ritualistic, expression of the sacred in words and deeds, almost, to use a Christian idea, sacramental. It's affirming what is sacred from the point of view of the enclosed, threatened enclave, where, the, where alone we have the sacred and they do not. Thus, the necessity of participating in a struggle that will build, bring about the full manifestation of the absolute. Comments from bin Laden make this painfully clear that his battle is against all the enemies of Islam typified most profoundly and most perfectly in his mind by the United States and its age in Israel. These religious images of struggle and conflict are often on the lips of very committed fundamentalists, usually by a select allegorical reading of the biblical text with a strong emphasis on the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation. Amun Sinkaro, who was a Buddhist who was responsible for the Syrian gas attack in the subways of Tokyo in 1995, said the reason he 
engaged in this kind of activity was that he was sure it would bring upon the world World War III and thus the end of all evildoers. Timothy McVeigh, whose favorite book appears to have been The Turner Diaries, which is a profoundly anti-Semitic, dualistic work, which sees the whole universe in terms of a warfare between the forces of light, who were identified as the Aryans, and the forces of darkness, who were identified as the liberals and the Jewish intellectual elite. Actually, according to some people who have studied this, picked the very day of the bombing because that was the day in which the Nazis moved in to the Warsaw Ghetto in April of 1943. In other words, he saw himself as participating in this cosmic struggle, this dualistic battle where the absolute and our control of the absolute needs to be articulated in the violence that is most terrifying. And thus, and only thus, can the participants who see be captured with a state of awe. Thus, I'm trying to say that this spiritualizing of violence, where religion is at the root of terrorism, gives terrorism a remarkable power, an awesome power. It is not that the people who are slaughtered are themselves enemies they themselves, busily working in the World Trade Center, trying to make a living. Oh no, it's a powerful attack against all that that building and that establishment represents. Okay. Now, the danger with any kind of present, this is, it's, it sounds very simplistic and it's very complex, but what I'm trying to say is, this impulse, which expresses itself throughout world religions, has a tremendous power. It's self-definitional. It's dualistic. It seeks to encapsulate the absolute, either for our own private use, and thus we withdraw, or as a way to convert others or as a justification for the destruction of others. Thanks to Frank, I have been uh, looking at uh, some of the material in Lonergan's second collection, which <laughs> Professor McShane has a, a piece in terms of the interview Bernard Lonergan back in 1970. And what impressed me in reading this with this presentation in my mind is the way in which he approaches the issue of the classicist worldview. He is, of course, speaking within his own context of trying to make sense of his own Catholic tradition in light of the dynamic changes that are happening immediately after the Second Vatican Council. But what I found impressive was the ways in which this helps, helps another approach to the very topic I'm here introducing regarding the nature of fundamentalism from the perspective of world religions. In the classicist tradition, as many of you know, there's very little, no, there's very little awareness of history, of meaning, certainly not of meaning that is embodied or embedded within traditions or sorry, within a context. Rather, there are eternal verities, universally valid laws. In this classicist worldview, strong emphasis upon abstraction, on universal claims that are absolutely normative. Clarity, coherence, rigor, not methods of observation or of discovery or of experimentation or of verification. Rather, 
a total knowledge, a grand synthesis, like a great medieval cathedral, a complete capturing of all that is true. It's deductive from a sacred text. It's definitional, it's normative, it's universal. Thus, what is affirmed is permanently true. The philosophy is perennial, it's static. The rules are rules. It's the move from the claim that God gives us the truth and we receive it without judgment, without struggle, we accept it, rolling off the lips of an authoritarian or authoritative teacher from a sacred text. Classical culture, Lonergan wrote in his essay entitled Belief Today, classical culture was stable. It took its stand on what ought to be, and what ought to be is not to be refuted by what is. It legislated with its eye on the substance of things, on the unchanging essence of human living, and while it never doubted either that circumstances alter cases or that circumstances change, still it was quite sure that essences did not change. That change affected only the accidental details that were really of no great account. So its philosophy was perennial, its classics were immortal, its religion and ethics enshrine the wisdom of things and the wisdom of the ages, its laws, its tribunals captured the prudence of all humanity. Classical culture, by conceiving itself normatively and universally, also had to think of itself as the one and only culture for all time. This could be said of every fundamentalist impulse that we can discern in world religions. They certainly wouldn't agree as to what constituted the culture, but the notion of its permanence, the notion of its stability, of its universality, would be a common characteristic. 